Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad that you could join us today uh, for this Emerging Scholars Network conversation. My name is Bob Truby, and I serve as the National Director for the Emerging Scholars Network. You know, over my life, I've seen both advances in civil rights and intensifying divisions around race. My conversation partner today thinks that the approaches we're taking to address racial issues contribute to that division. On the basis of his research, he proposes an alternative that he believes uh, may reduce divisions and address real problems through collaborative conversation and mutual accountability. I'm so glad you could join us today for this important conversation, one that I think is important both for the church and for our country. And I so appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us today. Before we begin, let me just orient you to a few things for our time together. One is that we will be recording today's conversation. If you prefer not to be recorded and photographed, please keep your mic muted and disable your video by continuing to participate in the conversation with your video and or audio enabled after the recording begins, you consent to allow InterVarsity to use the recording in any screenshots of our conversation for InterVarsity ministry purposes, including posting a video recording online for asynchronous viewing. I will stop recording now to give you a chance to disable your video if you wish, and uh, if you prefer not to be recorded. Well, it is, a, it is a pleasure for me to introduce our guest here. Let me spotlight him as well. Uh, our, our guest today is Dr. George Yancey. He is a professor of sociology uh, who has a joint uh, appointment in the Department of Sociology and at the Institute for Studies of Religion at Baylor University. He has published several research articles on topics of institutional racial diversity, racial identity, uh, academic bias, and, uh, and anti-Christian hostility. His books include Compromising Scholarship, a book that explores religious and political biases in the uh, academy, uh, What Motivates Cultural Progressives, a book that examines activists who uh, oppose the Christian right. There is no God, which investigates atheism in the United States. And so many Christians, so little, so few lions, a book title that I particularly like, uh, uh, that assesses Christianophobia in the United States. His current book, Beyond Racial Division, promotes collaborative communication as a solution to racial unrest. And we'll be talking about that today. Dr. Yancey, thank you so much for joining our conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, um, just to get us rolling here, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, your book opens with a discussion of two approaches to racial division that are not working, colorblindness and anti-racism. Uh, let's talk first about, I'd love to talk first about colorblindness. I've had people say to me with the, that with the advances in civil rights, there's no real racial issue today. Uh, it's the insistence on continuing to bring up past wrongs uh, and the teaching of critical race theory in schools that creates tensions. Why can't we follow Dr. King's advice to focus on the content of our character instead of the color of our skin? What's wrong with what is what you term colorblindness? Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. You know, first off, you know, I don't, people would say that about King, but I think it's not in the proper context of King's entire uh, life, his entire ministry. So I think it'd be careful about taking things out of context with King. But regardless, why not just say, hey, we're all equal. We all, you know, race is no longer important. My students, I ask them their race, some of them say, well, I don't have a race. I'm part of the human race. And I always tell them that's great philosophy and terrible sociology. 
And it's terrible sociology because if we truly, truly are equal in our society and race doesn't matter, then, then yeah, it makes sense to just be colorblind. But there's a lot of research showing that that's not the case. We go to criminal justice, work in the criminal justice system. We can look at uh, segregation, housing segregation. We can look at occupational discrimination. We can look at our healthcare system. There, you know, I, in my book, I, I give a few. Obviously, I don't, I, I can't give all the research. All the research itself would be in several books. So what the research tells us is that people of color, uh, in many different ways, uh, experience our reality, uh, distinctly from European Americans. It's not just an internal thing; that they're they're treated differently. I'll just give one example, and, and if people want to ask for more, I'd be happy to talk about more. There's what we call audit studies. Now, this is a study where we take an African American and a Hispanic American and a white American, uh, sometimes just the black and white, sometimes just the, uh, the white and the Hispanic, and they each apply for a job. And the question is, okay, if you make everything roughly equal in the resume, will people be called back more by the race? And they use names in order to signal the race. Now, it's not just, if it was just one or two studies, you could say, well, one or two studies, something could be wrong. There are a lot of studies, maybe hundreds of studies that have done this. Hmm. And when we've done a meta-analysis, where we put them all together, what we find is that, at, that uh, European Americans are called back for interviews more than the other two groups. And here's the just depressing part about this. The tendency for European Americans to be called back more has not decreased over the past couple of decades. In other words, this is not a trend that's going downward where more and more get more equality. The inequality in which people of color, African Americans and Hispanic Americans, are called back less for job interviews, which means they have a less of a chance of getting a job, that itself has not declined in the past couple of decades. So when you have situations like this, to ask people of color to say, just ignore this, ignore the wound that you have, that simply does not work. So for that reason, and you know, I can go more into uh, institutional racism and, and how the historical effects have continued to impact us. But th these wounds are here and we just can't ignore them and hope that they go away. Thank you, that, that, is, that is very helpful. Um, the, other, the other approach that you focus on that's being, that is often in play and particularly in many institutions, many employers, are approaches based on the idea of anti-racism. And you believe that's a, a, an approach that's really failing us as well. I wonder if you could define a little bit how you, how you use the term anti-racism and why do you believe that approach is failing us in addressing racial divisions? So anti-racism over the past few years has become a very popularized concept, but what does it mean? So to get the best idea of what it meant, I read the, popular anti-racism books at the time I was writing this book, it was about 2020. Mm -hmm. So of course that was Kindy's book, that was D'Angelo's book, that was uh, Olu's book. The, yeah. So uh, how to be anti-racist, white supremacy and me. So you want to talk about race, uh, white, white fragility, and a couple of others. And I read some more popular articles. So I wanted to hear what anti-racists themselves said in their own words. And I boiled it down to three tenants, and although there could be more, but three basic tenants to keep it simple. One, racism is multifaceted. It's in a lot of different areas of our lives. It's not just about personal prejudice. Two, we must be very proactive in dealing with racism. It's not enough to just say, well, I'm not personally racist. You have to try to be working towards the end of racism itself. Now, to be honest, those first two tenants, I, I have no problems with. I think that if we go from that, we probably could get something. But the third tenant, and once again, this was, I found this consistently in all the books and in most of the articles I read. And the third tenant is basically this, the role of whites is to do what people of color want them to do. Now, what that meant different from book to book, but that was the general attitude that is in these books. And I think that's where anti-racism gets off the track, honestly. Now, that's my opinion, right? But there's a lot of research on this. A lot of people have done research on say diversity training because one of the recommendations is we got to train people, we got to teach them to, to be anti-racist. Well, does that work? Well, the research says it doesn't. That it does not reduce prejudice long-term. The research says that it also can create a backlash. 
So that's problematic. Uh, there's also research that shows that if you do things such as mandatory diversity training, if you do things such as grievance committees, you know, try to be very, you know, telling whites to do what people of color want them to do, you actually will hire less people of color five years later if you're looking at businesses. If you engage those whites and, and, and have them help you to solve the problem instead of telling them what to do, you actually get more people of color five years later. So anti-racism, the way that we have conceptualized it today, the, the research shows it does not work. It does, it does not reduce prejudice. Uh, if you bring in white privilege and teach about white privilege, you can actually create more hostility towards marginalized whites without increasing sympathy towards uh, African-American, uh, marginalized, marginalized African-Americans. So if you get more marginalization against, you know, more hostility against marginalized people. So if we want something that works, something that you know actually changes perspectives and changes societies, changes our organizations. Anti-racism consistently is not shown to be very effective. You, uh, you have, your research has led you to propose a different uh, model uh, that you uh, call collaborative conversations with mutual accountability. And I wonder if you might explain a little bit about how that model works and why you think it's better. Okay, uh, so my, my, my idea is that if we try to tell other people how to think and how to do without entering into a conversation with them, a healthy conversation, that's gonna create the problems. And so the colorblind person says, look, you have to be with me and say, race doesn't matter. Well, that doesn't work for people of color. The anti-racist says, whites, you have to do what people of color tell you to do. Well, that doesn't work. So rather than do either one of those, what I think, and I think there's a, there's a biblical basis for this, by the way. But what I think what we have to do is have separate situation where we can dialogue about what is happening and how we can find solutions. People don't want to change until they feel they are heard. And when they are heard, then they're open to change. We can't dictate to people how they're going to address the issues. We got to work with people how to address these issues. So what I call cloud conversations is how do we work with people? If I was to give you an elevator speech of what my book is about, and of course you have to unwrap it more than that, but an elevator speech is, how can we deal with racial issues by having healthy conversations in a way where we can get people of all different racial groups to, to buy in to our solutions? That only happens at the end of a, of a conversation where everyone feels like they got their ideas on the table, we work it through. No one gets every single thing that they want. Humans don't work well getting every single thing that they want. I have kids, I know this. And, but we find the best possible solution. I wanna be clear about something. Uh, I call it a mutual obligations approach, a mutual responsibility approach. And some people think that that means that I think that the solution is gonna be that whites, non-whites have the same, have the same outcomes. And that's not the case. The mutual part is we all, and this goes beyond race, whatever race you are, whatever political ideology you are, we all have the responsibility of entering into the conversation in a healthy way, listening to others and trying to work with them. That is the mutual part. The solutions don't necessarily have to look mutual. And in fact, I think a lot of times they're not gonna be given our history of racial abuse. But if we don't enter that conversation in a mutual way, we won't get to those solutions in a way that's healthy. And that's my concern that we've not been doing that. Well, uh, and I'm glad I'm glad you raised this because one of the things that I one of my one of the things I wondered about as I was reading the book and I've I've seen in 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 many uh, many approaches is the emphasis on uh, that in a sense uh, blacks and other minorities have been bearing the bur the, the bulk of the burden, and that it's the majority culture that needs to do the work and. Uh, I think on the one hand, you're saying both everybody should be involved, but that in terms of some of the solutions, there might be a greater burden that some of the majority culture folks bear, even within a mutual accountability and responsibility structure. Is that is that right? Yes. Now, I want to be very clear. You, you cannot predetermine the answers because if you predetermine the answers, then you're telling people what the answers are going to be. So yeah. so the answer may well be, you know, for this for this particular there are times where I am colorblind. When I grade my students' papers, I am colorblind. I, I do not want to know their race. 
you know, their grade mm -hmm. is their grade. So, uh, so that, so, so I'm not saying the solution won't be that. So you can't predetermine the solution. What I'm saying is when you understand our history of racial abuse and the institutionalized ways in which marginalized uh, racial groups suffer today, I think a lot of times the solutions will not be a colorblind solution. It will be something where, okay, here's our solution. Here's what whites are gonna do, here's what people of color are gonna do. And the burden at that point is gonna probably be more on whites than people of color, but it's not gonna be that way every single time. It's not, a, there's not a cookie cutter way of doing this. It, it, it's messy, mm -hmm. I, I know it's messy. Yeah. But you know, if, there, if it was a cookie cutter way, then someone would have figured it out and we would have done it by now. I think we haven't figured it out because we haven't realized this is gonna be messy and the same solution that works with this particular group and this situation may not work in this situation. And that's okay. Because people will come to different conclusions as they interact with others. So yes, I, uh, this is not, uh, you know, people just should not mistake this for some sort of colorblind light or even anti-racism light uh, solution because it's not, it's a different approach to how we solve racial problems. Okay. Um, now, tell me a little bit about some of the research that support, you know, what research support is there for the approach that you're proposing? Okay, so let me just be very honest that we don't, we've, we don't what we don't have is research on this in a racial context. So collaborative conversations in a racial context. In fact, I'm trying to work on that, that research right now. Uh, it's gonna take a while because I want to do it right and make sure it's a long-term effect. So it takes a while. So I, I can't tell you I have the data right now on, on the long-term effect of it. But what I can tell you is we have other research that suggests that highly suggests that this is gonna be success, successful. For example, the research I just mentioned on how do you hire more people of color as managers? You take white them out, white managers, and you and you basically tell them, look, you know, we want you to work with us. We want you to mentor, we want you to help us with recruiting. We want, you know, we want, we want you to be in charge of, of diversity initiatives. In other words, you, you help us make these decisions instead of here's what you need to do. And the research shows that this actually has more people of color being hired when you do this than when you try to dictate to them. That says something. There's research on, on contact, uh, contact hypothesis. It shows that under the right conditions, interracial contact alleviates bias. There's research on, on identity. That if we have a common group of identity, if we're working together, then we have less hostility. There's research on collaborative conversations in families, in therapeutic situations, in education. And once again, it tends to produce a situation where people volitionally work together. So there's research in other contexts. And so what we need to do is figure out how we can apply this in a racial setting. And then that's something that I'm working on right now. And like I said, I wish I, could, I, wish I had it right now. Uh, I think maybe this time next year, I'll, I may have something, but, and I think it's gonna work. I think we may have to figure out how to make it work because everywhere else we're seeing that this actually is how you solve problems. And we know this as humans. We know that we wanna solve problems. We don't go to someone else and say, okay, here's how to solve the problems. You do what I want you to do. We solve problems by working together and figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And so we gotta do the same thing with race. You, uh... You've actually mentioned, you've mentioned one example of how this collaborative approach works. Uh, are there other, any other stories that you can share about um, uh, um, anecdotal stories uh, that uh, reflect ways this model has worked? Yeah, so in the book, I did talk about Game Changers, which, uh, you know, it is an organization out in, uh, in, in California, I believe, San, no, Los Angeles where they're bringing in uh, people from the community and police officers and, and having them talk through the issues. Now they're not solving problems per se, but they're learning, they're learning about each other and they're learning how to, they're learning about the perspective of someone else, which is very, very valuable. There's an, also an organization, which I'm starting to get to know a little bit better called uh, Better Angels. I'm not sure whether it's a Christian organization or not, but they are trying to have better conversations. I think what's, what, well, I've seen missing. I think these, these organizations are great, by the way. I, I, I don't want them to come up with, like I'm criticizing them. I think part of the element is problem solving because I think that's going to put an additional, uh, additional. I think it, it, it will really help 
bring the conversation along. So not, not just under, talking for understanding, which is very important. And to solve the problem, you have to understand where people are coming from. So it's very important. But I also think that uh, we got to figure out a way to solve problems. I'm not sure if Better Angels does this or not, but I'm trying to look into them and, and figure out more about them. So there's a couple of examples. Unfortunately, most examples uh, that we see on talk, discuss with racial issues doesn't have this element to it. And, and that's why I think that oh, in our society, we failed a lot in dealing with racial issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One, of the, one of the questions I found myself wrestling with as I read the book was that your approach seems to assume that there's reasonable persons on both sides of the discussion or all the sides yeah. of an issue. And historically, that's not always been the case. You know, <laughs> certainly, you know, uh, in the work that Dr. King did, uh, I, I think there were many times when people resisted uh, advances in civil rights, whether it was on buses or uh, voting rights, uh, accommodations and so forth. Uh, what do you do? How does your method apply, if at all, in those kinds of situations? Or what do you recommend? So I fully admit that, you know, there's a certain amount of faith that's coming out of this. And, and I, I would argue that the strongest counter argument to my argument is, can we actually do it? Can we actually execute it? So I will admit that that is, that, that, that's a worth, worth looking at. And my experience is that no matter what perspective you have, what side you have, uh, you always have some people who are reasonable and some people who are not reasonable. And so I'm gambling that we have enough reasonable people of all perspectives to have this discussion. And, uh, and then they will eventually influence the unreasonable people. So, 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 so that's the gamble I'm having. There are extremists on the colorblind side and the anti-racism side who you cannot have this conversation right now with. I just accept that. Let's have the conversation with the people who we can at this point and let's eventually get enough of us talking that they feel pressure to eventually have to talk. So, so, so there's that. Now, one thing, so that's, I, I, I understand that that is an assumption, uh, you know, it's an assumption born out of seeing what's, seeing what's out there. You know, when I get into an issue, I quickly find out who's reasonable, who's not. And if a person's somewhat reasonable, we can have a, we can have a good dialogue. And I, I can have a dialogue where I'm not trying to browbeat them, but we're trying to understand one another. Now here's, the one bit of scientific evidence I think supports my contention. Uh, even with the unreasonable people, in time they can be brought along. There's, there's a similar idea that I've just been reading a little bit more. Uh, I think it's in the uh, in counseling called motivational interviewing. And a lot of it is related, the way it's done is a lot of it is similar to collaborative conversation, the way that we let people talk things out and figure things out on their own. And what's used for is for people who are addicted to substance abuse and it's been shown to be very successful. It's not 100%, but very successful. So my thinking is, all right, if this procedure can help people overcome substance abuse, then there's, even among the unreasonable people, there's gotta be a percentage of them that given time can overcome their biases, their, their intrinsic nature, their unwillingness to consider other perspectives. Uh, not everyone, but at least a percentage. And if we can get them along the reasonable people, eventually we can outnumber the unreasonable people. So, so yeah, now is, is that somewhat of a faith? Yeah, but I think it's a better gamble than doing what we've done so, so far. Because if you like the results of our racial relations right now, then we need to keep doing what we're doing right now. If you don't want the results, we need to do something different. And the sort of cycle of a racial incident and then protests and counter protests and then normalcy to the other, we got to break that somehow. And doubling down on one of the other two models, I think is just going to replicate that again and again and again. So at least this gives us a chance to break that. And I think that we need to take that chance because I'm tired of the same cycle we see it again and again and again hmm. yeah yeah well i think many of us are i and so i appreciate you proposing this well it's time for us to take a break and to let people know how they can get your book uh, uh so i i've put into the chat um a link uh a, a link to university press where you can order the book at a 30 percent discount uh 
uh, I'm going to also show you the book so that you can actually see that. Uh, just a moment here. Yeah, the book that we're talking about today is Beyond Racial Division, and you can order that at InterVarsity Press for a 30% discount uh, through, the through the next week uh, using the uh, code GFMWeb22 at the checkout, which is good until May 26th. Uh, also want to mention it also in the chat, for those who may have to leave early are the links to our our next two conversations, uh, both in early June, uh, that you might be interested in joining us for. Well, let's go to uh, let's go to some of the questions that people have asked. Uh, let me scroll back through here. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't uh, who have questions and li would like to post those, please do in the chat. Um, Okay, there were several comments that uh, Tiana makes uh, to me, uh, made to me. One was academic bias was mentioned in the introduction and uh, she was actually intrigued to know a little bit more about that uh, as an area of research that you've been involved in. Yeah, so about, I guess about 10 years ago, uh, I had a book come out called, uh, uh, now I forgot the name of the book, <laughs> uh, Compromise and Scholarship, yes. Uh, and what I did when, in that book was I actually sent a survey out to academics and I had them ask the question, would you be more or less willing to hire someone if you found out this about them? And part of it was religious identity. And what I found, I actually went into it thinking there'd be more political bias than religious bias. Uh, I found more religious bias than political bias against conservative Protestants. Uh, fundamentalists and evangelicals, about half of the academics say they'd be less willing to hire you if they found out you were one of those two identities, which is pretty amazing when you think about that. Uh, I mean, that's the difference between getting a job or not. If, you, if half your, your committee is less willing to hire you if they find out your political, your, your religious identity. With politics, is about a third, so it wasn't quite as bad. So, you know, I, I, I did that. I looked at some blogs, uh, some qualitative data, and I wrote, wrote, that, wrote up that book. Uh, I've also done some other research with another survey, uh, seeing how people rank uh, people of, of different uh, faiths and how they comment on conservative Protestants. And once again, so there is, there is this bias against conservative Protestants that has to be reckoned with uh, as we look into that. Uh, that's going to shape the sort of research that gets done uh, beyond, you know, the who get hired, what sort of grants get funded, how you can, if you do get a research in there, you have to figure out a way to do it in a way that, that passes mustard for that particular paradigm. So I think that it does, beyond being a Christian, I think it does impact science in a negative way. And obviously it's not the same for all sciences, like something like uh, geography probably doesn't really matter as much, although there's a bias in, in the hard sciences as well. But still, it's something that you have to consider. So that's where a lot of that work comes from. Okay. Um, just uh, somebody had asked about a question about uh, uh, just an open discussion period when uh, 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 things would not be uh, recording. And that's actually at top of the hour. So if you're able to stay after our conversation, after our record the recorded conversation is through at the top of the hour, we will uh, 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 be interact. We can interact informally for a few more minutes. Um, okay, one other question that came up. Um, you know, one of, one of the people on the call mentioned uh, they did not see See, they've, they've read Kendi and D'Angelo and didn't pick up this message uh, on do, do what uh, colored people tell you to do. Uh, help, uh, and they're asking, help me understand uh, where and how that message was communicated. And uh, so. Sure, be happy to. Right, so D'Angelo, if you read D'Angelo, she, she, she explicitly says in her book, you know, what are white people to do? And, she's, and she, she says, and I can go to the passage, I, mean, I can't remember it word for word, but you know, it, it just struck me. Uh, what white people are to do is listen to people of color and then try to do better. Uh, they're, not allowed to, they're not allowed to be mad. They're not allowed to, to object. They're not allowed to cry. 
I mean, she, she, she really, she puts this in the book. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. What you can do is listen, listen to people of color and try to do better. And, it, and I think in my book, I even cite that passage because I think that that's that one of the clearest examples of why people do what people of color tell them to do. Because if that's all you can do is listen to people and then try to do better, then that's basically saying, you know, I mean, she talks about other things such as denying your identity as a white person, things like that. But to me, that's a very clear one. Kindy, Kindy is very interesting in that Kindy's one of the few anti-racists who will say, well, if you're black, you can be a racist too. For Kindy, anything is either racist or anti-racist. There's, there's no non-racist with Kindy. Now, what's, what's anti-racist? Anti-racist is what Kindy says it is. I mean, go back and read the book. Kindy says, you know, if you're a capitalist, that's racist. To be non-capitalist is anti-racist. If you're this, that's... So Kindy, Kindy as an African-American gets to define what anti-racism is. And for you to be anti-racist, then you are now having to do what Kennedy tells you he needs you to do. Now, Kennedy, to, to, I guess to his credit, says you can be a black and a racist, and someone like D'Angelo would not say that. But basically, Kennedy is saying, you know, what we, what I as an African American and those who think like me say is anti-racist, that's what you need to do. There's no attempt at discussion. So there's really almost. And I went through these books and I, and I gave them an honest reading. There's no attempt at discussing things with whites. The, the thing is to dictate to whites what they need to do. And I think D'Angelo and Kimmy both do that uh, pretty clearly. Look at your, one of the people uh, in our conversation asks, what are the settings or conditions that support the kinds of conversations that you're proposing? So given our, social media society, we can't just say, throw people in a room and have a conversation, okay? So we all know that that's not gonna work uh, nine out of 10 times. Maybe one time we get lucky. I think what we have to do is, is uh, talk to people about how we enter into this conversation. One thing I talked about in my book is how do we engage in what we call active listening? How do we listen, not to argue with people, but listen to understand where people are coming from, so that we can have a better conversation uh, than what we're having today. And so, and how do we communicate with people? There's research that shows that if I communicate to you in a way that you feel threatened, then you can no longer hear me. No matter what I say, you can't hear me because you feel threatened. So it's also important how we learn how to communicate with people that's productive. Uh, rather than one that creates barriers. So I think part of it, and this is part of what I'm trying to do, is try, can, we, can we train people well enough that they can have this conversation that it has product, uh, a productive value? Uh, I think that's the challenge that we have. I think people have to be open to having the conversation, which is one thing, reason why I say, look, if someone's not open to the conversation, don't try to force it, because you'll just frustrate them and frustrate you. A person has to be willing to, okay, I, I really want to hear from you. I really want to have this conversation. Uh, I, I'm, I, I think that there's a good chunk of the, of the country that's open to the conversation right now. I think, and, I'm, and this is anecdotal, all right, and maybe some surveys that aren't directly on point, but I think about half the country is like, I'm tired of this arguing. Let's have an honest conversation. So I think that there are people who are open to it. And we had to find them and, and start there. But yeah, I think train people on how to listen, how to communicate, uh, having, having an open perspective, having a plan in action, how we're going to approach things, how we're going to try to uh, enunciate where other people are coming from. These are things that we have to, uh, to do. Uh, and, and so that's where, where I think we're at. I do I think also think it's important that, you know, we have to do this in a way where uh, people, know that we don't have an agenda going into it, that we're, we're not there to try to force you into our agenda. Because uh, I think that that's part of why people resist a lot. Now, I think certain outcomes will, will happen if we are, are, are having an open dialogue, but it's sort of like you try to force it to happen, then it doesn't. So, uh, so I think that that, I mean, we all know the, pe the person or people in our lives that when you tell them to do, to go to the right, they all have to go to the left. So, uh, so I think we have to be, you know, be open about that. Hey, 
we don't have an agenda other than we want to find better solutions and we'll work together. Uh, I think that that could be our agenda. Well, what you just said might tie into uh, the next comment question that I uh, we have here. Uh, one of our viewers writes, I, I read the book and I'm glad you wrote it. I'm frustrated with the binary choice of colorblind anti-racist, uh, but there's also the political component. I've read the literature and in the anti-racist view, it seems that there's a very, it is very tied to a socialist movement. It's, uh, it's not all about racism. There's a political component conflated in there. How does one deal with that? I, I wonder, first of all, if you would agree with that with that, with, with that observation and then uh, you, your response to that. Okay, what I'm going to agree with is that politics matters greatly. In fact, I've been playing around with some data and the data clearly shows that the most important predictor on your racial attitudes is not your race, it's your political outcome. So I agree. Now, I'm not gonna make the connection to anti-racism and socialism. Uh, you know, are some anti-racist socialists? Yes, but I, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make that sort of stereotype because I don't, I don't know if that's, if that's helpful. But yeah, so what that means is we got to think beyond our political enclaves. And the United States is such a politically polarized country that sometimes I think, you know, if we can, if we can figure out how to uh, not demonize people who vote the way we don't, we go a long way to solving the racial problems. You know, we can figure out that. We can probably figure out race, you know, in a snap. So, so yeah, that political dynamic. And I think at this point, what I would say is recognize that, recognize that in you, uh, that your politics may be driving some of your some of your racial attitudes. And so, don't that may help you be a little bit less defensive when you hear a perspective that you disagree with. That you know, it may not, you know, that it may be your, they may be not speaking to your racial identity, but to your political beliefs. Uh, and, uh, and I think that would be uh, something worth considering. Hmm. Another, uh, another one of our viewers asks, part of the difficulty of dialogue is interpreting the research. Some sides interpret all racial or other gaps in wealth, education, health, et cetera, as discrimination. Uh, others are more careful. I think we need to look deeper there are other gaps, for example, Asian white that seem likely not driven by racism. Some training materials I've encountered through my kids in school and through my university cherry pick studies uh, that find greater gaps and ignore the ones that find the opposite. Uh, most people uh, in the dialogue don't go to the original sources or understand them, but often start with conclusions and or uh, read summaries of a bias sample of them. How is dialogue possible in this case? <laughs> okay, so let's just be honest that all of us have we're going to bring our own biases into the dialogue, into the dialogue. So yeah, uh, and training that does that is not in the spirit of what I'm talking about. So the training comes down and says, okay, we're going to because the spirit of what I'm talking about is you don't come in. The trainer does not come in with an agenda to try to force people to accept. So if you come in with all this study. And, and say, hey, you know, here's how you accept this solution, then that is not, that, that's, that's not gonna be useful. Uh, I, think we, I think once again, you go back to, are people really willing to have a dialogue? And if they are, are they willing to learn how to communicate and how to listen? Uh, and I think that that is, is where, you, where you have to, have to go to. Uh, so, so I think that that's, that's, that's where our focus, I think should be at this stage, is to how do, how do we have a healthy dialogue regardless of what we bring, regardless of our biases. And, and in fact, our biases will be revealed by the dialogue. So as I go in and I, and I have this dialogue, oh my gosh, I didn't see this, this other type of way of looking at it. It must be because I am biased. I, have this, I bring this bias into, into the mix. So it's a way in which we can better understand one another when we uh, just admit that we all are going to bring some certain biases into this process. That's okay, as long as we're open to hearing other people out and trying to figure out how we can solve a problem together. That's okay that we bring these biases. One one question that uh, uh, I think really touches on an important uh, issue, and what you're talking about in dialogue, is 
how do we balance the tension between supporting conversations that are caring without protecting white comfort? You know, there, I think there, you know, maybe that this is referring to, you know, this idea of white fragility. And sometimes you have to be, you know, especially handle conversations with whites with kid gloves, as it were, uh, 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 or it evokes uh, reactions. And uh, when in fact, oftentimes uh, persons of color have, have, have experienced terrible oppression and offenses for, for long periods of time. So how do, we, how do we have conversations that are genuinely mutual and collaborative, but are not limited by protecting white comfort? Okay, so as I said, you know, if you, and this is true. I mean, one of the problems with white fragility of the book is that there's no research showing that whites are uniquely fragile. Uh, it was okay. just her opinion. Uh, so this is true for everyone. We have to talk to people in a way they can hear. So if, if what we say is threatening, people can't hear. Now, what does that mean? It means that we have to engage in tact. Now, before you say, well, why should I have to engage in tact? Why, why, you know, why do I have to tone myself, what, you know, police my, my tone, what have you? I'm gonna tell you that you do it anyways. And if you don't, then you are lousy in your job, you know? You don't say the first thing that comes to your head. Uh, you don't, yeah, I mean, you, you're probably not someone who, who's having a great marriage if you're not, if you don't have some degree of tact of policing. That does not mean that you're dishonest with your spouse or with your students or with your colleagues or with whoever. It means that, you know, you just can't say the first thing in your head and expect them to just receive it and, and not be affected by that. Likewise, I think when we have these conversations, you engage in tact. Uh, this does not mean that that you're that you're dishonest. So it, I don't think you have to be dishonest, but I do think that you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And how how would you like to hear bad news? Think about that, because unless you know, unless you're perfect, which we know none of us are, you've done things, or or you've you've uh, had people have to confront you at times, right? Now, the ones who, who are successful, how have they done in a way that's successful? Chances are they didn't just say whatever was in their mind. So I think that we have, you know, I think that's just a skill we all have to develop. How do we talk to people in a way that they can hear us? Now, this is something that I have worked on. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone to uh, conferences, mostly whites, and I found ways to talk to them in ways they can hear me. And I'm, I'm having to evolve in the way I've done. The way I've done in the past, which I may have to evolve from, is I used to talk about research that shows that whites are more like white Christians are more likely to date kids. Their kids are more likely to date people outside of their faith than outside of their race. I don't say it correctly, uh, and that gets their attention because they think about their kids, you know, marrying a white atheist. Uh, and so you say things because you learn a, you learn enough about people to what motivates them, and then you can talk to them in a way they can hear you. But if you just you know you say, well, you know. I can't spare their feelings. I gotta say whatever is on my mind. We don't do that in real life. Uh, so why would we do that here? We just got to uh, think about how we want to be treated and do accordingly. And none of that removes all the problems of, of institutional uh, discrimination or of, of ways whites have been in our society. None of it removes all that. And I'm not saying don't be truthful. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And, mm. and if you want people, people be truthful with you, but you probably don't want them to do it in a way that uh, is that could come off as demeaning or a way that's that's so threatening that you can't hear them. So just think about it that way. This is a great question. How do you deal with the fact that the wounds and history that you mentioned earlier also come into our, our dialogues? Uh, from that perspective, it seems the default would be for would be for be a conversation that is biased toward whites. How can open dialogue take place without addressing these historical issues, uh, the historical abuses? I don't know why you. Would, I don't know why we would think that it would take place without addressing those issues. I, you know, I guess it depends on the issue you're talking about at the time, obviously. But if we're if we're talking about well, you know, if we're talking about policing, uh, then we got to look at what's happened historically as well as what's happened today. We're looking at our our education system. Uh, we're looking at our churches. I mean, what's happened historically in your in your church? So I don't think you don't. You know, I don't know why you don't. Why you wouldn't address those sort of issues? 
under the conditions that I've just talked about. You know, you want to dress them in a way that people can hear you, but yeah, you want to dress them. I don't know that that really buys the conversation towards why it's, I, I, I don't quite understand where, 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 where it would, uh, other than maybe the person thinks that, that I think that you don't bring those issues up at all. But I, no, I think you have to be careful about rabbit trails, right? So you don't bring up an issue just for bringing up an issue just to, so you could do that and that, that's a possibility. But if it's relevant, why would we not discuss uh, the historical uh, aspects that brought us to the situation where we're here? Uh, do you understand why African Americans and Hispanic Americans are not uh, vaccinated at the same rates and what you need to do in our healthcare system? We're gonna talk about the, 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 the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment. We gotta talk about you know, ways that uh, people of uh, marginalized communities have been mistreated by our healthcare system. The enduring racism is still in our healthcare system. So we gotta talk about all that sort of stuff you know, as we're looking at trying to solve this current problem. It's not the only thing we're gonna talk about. So the, if the question is, is this the only thing we're gonna talk about? No, but yeah, it's part of the conversation. Yeah. Um... Had uh, uh, one of the questions is just uh, that was raised to us. Oftentimes, it's a real uh, person says, I find I struggle with finding or making space for such conversations in the church setting. How can we bring this to the forefront? In the church, it seems to be very hard to separate religion from politics. Yeah, I mean, you know, some churches are very bad at that, <laughs> separating religion from politics. And of course, politics sometimes gets into moral issues. And so, I, you know, but uh, I, I tend to not like churches that get too political. It doesn't even matter what the politics is. I just, you know, morality is one thing, politics is nothing. So, you know, I, but those churches exist. So, so I think some churches are open to it. And some church, I mean, I think, that, I think that's the, the easiest answer is that there are churches that are not ready to have this conversation and those that are. And likely if it's a church that is very, that, that, wear the political identity on a sleeve and lead with that, chances are they're probably not ready for the conversation because politics is such a big predictor of our racial attitudes. But if it's a church that doesn't, then I think the chances are they are open to, to leading that. And so I think that that is probably where we're coming from. Uh, so if you're, if you're going to a church where, where it is very politicized and for whatever reason, you don't want to try to find a different church, I, I understand that. Uh, I guess you just have to, I, I would actually work on the political angle first before I got to the racial angle. Uh, so, you know, talking about why are we, you know, engaging in politics. I will say that, and, I, and this is from my research on multiracial churches, is that churches that are multiracial tend to be less politically driven. They tend to be less about the politics. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't uh, talk about racism or moral issues or things of this nature or they're less likely to be political on either side. So, uh, so I think that that is something worth considering. Although once again, that's not a panacea. That, that is, you, you come worship diverse mm -hmm. and you know, there, there is no panacea like that. Well, we're coming toward the end of our time. And uh, I just wanted to see if you had any kind of concluding words or con concluding challenge for us uh, as it relates to uh, the, your book, the idea of collab collaborative conversations? So, you know, I will say that the most challenging aspect that I feel challenged on this is, can we do it? This, this is gonna be a lot of hard work. And so I'm very realistic in that this is not gonna happen very soon. Uh, if we're gonna go in this direction, we're gonna, we're gonna have to commit to do it for the long term because the colorblindness and anti-racism have an outsized influence on how we think about racial issues. People feel like they have to go one or the other. I, 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 I hope that in my kids' lifetime that we can get to a stage in our country to where we, to where we value conversations more than conflict, but we're not there yet. Uh, I hope that in time, more and more people want to be committed towards heading that direction. Uh, I'm willing to work towards that. Uh, if that's something you want to work towards, I welcome, you know, I'm, I'm older now. When I was younger, I used to think I got to change everything on my own. I've gotten older, more tired, and I, I accept help more readily than I used to. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's something that as a team effort that we got to work together and understand that this is a long-term project. So that's, 
I guess my closing challenge if you, if you want it that way. Mm. It's a good challenge. Well, um, thank you so much for uh, uh, just a really good dialogue. And I, I want to particularly uh, call out our uh, audience today too and, and thank them for such great thought-provoking questions. Uh, I, I, this is really the kind of conversations we hope to host and, and you as an audience have been a really big part of it. So thank you so much for very actively engaging uh, with the conversation today. We just want to highlight one more time, uh, Dr. Yancey's book. Um, I'm gonna put the link for that as well as for our future conversations uh, in the chat. Uh, and we'll also put the uh, slide up on the screen again. Um, uh, so the book we've been talking about today is Beyond Racial Division. And uh, uh, we really do hope that you'll pick up a copy of it. Uh, we've been able to scratch the surface on this book today. There's so much more uh, in there that uh, is, is, is really challenging and, and thought provoking. And so we really, I, I just, I, I really enjoyed reading the book and uh, would thoroughly commend it to everybody. Uh, just a, we have a couple of conversations coming up that we wanna tell you about. Our, our, next con our next conversation is going to be on June 2nd at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, our guest is going to be Amy Kenny, who uh, is actually herself a disabled Christian and writes about how uh, the church and our institutions ought to deal with uh, 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 persons with disabilities. Uh, her book is called My Body is Not a Prayer Request. Uh, disability of Justice in the Church, and uh, Amy is actually a Shakespeare scholar, and uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation there, and there's uh, the link is in the chat for that. Also, uh, a week later, June 9th, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 11 Pacific, uh, we're going to welcome Jason Baxter, and this is going to be just a, a really fun conversation for all of you who are Inklings. Uh, on the medieval mind of C.S. Lewis. Uh, and he argues that Lewis's uh, uh, work was influenced not only by scripture, but his love of ancient mythology. And particularly uh, authors like Dante and Boethius, uh, who informed his thinking. And so uh, Hannah Eagleson, who is herself a medieval scholar, will be actually hosting that conversation. Uh, so I'm looking forward to listening along with the rest of you on uh, June 9th, and so we hope you'll join us. The links for registering for both of those conversations are in the chat, and we'd invite you to do that today. Well, uh, just to wrap up, we do want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, uh, we want to thank, uh, uh, first of all, Dr. Yancey for taking uh, time out of what I'm sure is a, a full schedule academically uh, to be in this conversation and uh, for sharing his work. Uh, we want to thank InterVarsity Press, who's co-sponsored this with us uh, for their sponsorship and participation. And I especially want to thank all of you. I, as I mentioned, uh, this has been a really fun conversation because of you, uh, because of your questions, uh, your engagement. Uh, I will mention we'll be stopping the recording in a moment here. And if anybody wants to stick around for a few minutes and talk further, uh, we will leave the connection open. Uh, we would invite you, uh, this is an effort hosted by the Emerging Scholars Network, and we would love for you to, uh, to join us if you're not already a member of the Emerging Scholars Network. It's free. Uh, we provide resources like these conversations, our blog at blogemergingscholars.org, and that's where you'd actually sign up for membership. And also you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and regularly, particularly on Facebook and Instagram, we uh, repost a number of resources that we think are helpful for people in their academic journey. Uh, also, uh, this conversation will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and we have about 30, 30 conversations that are available there uh, that you might, uh, you can access uh, if you've missed some of past, our past conversations. So I'd encourage you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you'll, that way you'll receive notifications whenever there's a new conversation recorded. Well, with that, uh, uh, once again, I, uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. 
Uh, we're gonna we'll stop the recording now, and uh, those who are interested are welcome to stick around.